Yeah, so now I am uh, on my laptop. This is a terminal. In fact, uh, this is I am on a Windows laptop and this is actually a what do you call a Ubuntu terminal on a Windows laptop because nowadays Windows has this uh, concept called WSL. So I have installed Ubuntu on this. So now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do SSH to Devopedia website. So just to give you some context, this is a Devopedia website. I was just talking about it a little earlier. This is the home page of devopedia.org. Now, obviously, what we are doing here is making a HTTP request to devopedia.org where there is a HTTP server running. In fact, it's an Apache server. So the server processes this HTTP request and gives back this response. And you give a different request, let's say test event develop development. So you give a request to this URL and then the web server will return with this content. So that's uh, as far as the role of the web server goes. Today, what we are interested is in secure shell. So it so happens that on the same server, we have on the same mission rather, uh, we have a SSH server also running. So what we will try to do from my laptop is to connect to that SSL server, SSH server. So I will do SSH devopedia at devopedia.org. So those who have used SSH before, you would be familiar with the syntax. This is the name of the server or what we call as the server host name. This is the name of the user on that server. So now I'm saying log devopedia user on this server over SSH connection. So the syntax is quite simple. And when you do this, it asks for something called passphrase for the key. So it so happens that there is a key between the client and the server and it is asking for passphrase. So this is one level of uh, you know securing the system. We will get into the details later. I'll just go through the demo right now. Now it is logged in. So once it is logged in, I can now run commands remotely on the remote server. So now we are inside Devopedia server where the home path is home Devopedia and this is the file structure. And I can run pretty much all the because it's a Linux terminal Ubuntu basically uh, Ubuntu or yeah, I think it's Ubuntu. So you can run pretty much uh, all the Linux commands. So now what we have really achieved is that from my local computer or desktop, I'm able to log into a remote system with nothing but a terminal. Okay. And I can of course exit and come back to my laptop. Now this looks very trivial, but uh, you know, uh, back in the, to give you some historical context, back in the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, people were not so aware of security. I mean, they knew that the systems had to be secure, but there was no system like SSH to open a terminal remotely and do it securely. So the kind of systems we had in those days were actually Telnet. So Telnet is a pro old program which has been around since the late 1960s because that's when the internet itself started. So since the 1960s, people have been using Telnet. Then a little later, since the 1980s, people started using a slightly better program called R login, remote login. So the purpose of these programs were from a local system, uh, you should be a, a programmer or a system administrator or a network administrator should be able to log into a remote system with nothing but a command line interface and then run commands on that remote system. So that was the purpose of these programs. Unfortunately, these programs were not secure in the sense that they did not run on any secure transport or network layer. So as a result, Telnet, for example, will ask for username and password. Same thing with our login. So these systems would prompt the user to supply a username and login, uh, password. And this username and password were not encrypted, which means anybody who's looking at the network traffic, they can pretty much see the password. So when I started my career, uh, so I graduated in 1997. 
and pretty much in my first job i had this experience where i was of course i was working in the university at that time as a research engineer and one day i decided that i will log into the lab system from home i did that using telnet the very next day the lab system got hacked because that's when i really realized that telnet is not secure because anybody who is looking at the traffic they can snoop and figure out what is the username and password so this is how things were you know right up to the 1990s it is surprising to us that people knew about computer networking and securing computer networks but they didn't give much th thought to securing remote access so it may seem strange because uh, today remote access is pretty much common but back in those days it was not so common because when computer network started what was the real uh, use of uh, uh, kind of logging into a remote terminal it was mainly to connect to mainframes so you are in an office or you are in a university corporate network or in a university network so you are in your department and you want to connect to the let's say a supercomputer or you want to connect to a mainframe you would do it within the network of the corporate of the enterprise or within the network of that uh, campus university campus so now all people within the campus they are already authenticated so you are kind of trusting uh, you you are kind of believing that only trusted users are allowed to log in remotely so that was the premise in which these systems were invented but uh, when uh, network networking be became uh, kind of when networking was applied to wide area networks and people could do remote login over the internet that's when people started to realize that you know these kind of programs are not really secure so that is the context in which uh, secure cell shell was born so uh, historically secure shell itself was invented in the 1950s uh, 1990s so it was invented in finland helsinki university of technology by yoren uh, uh, so exactly this kind of situation which i faced so i faced it in 1997 he faced it just 2 years earlier and uh, if i had known that uh, program such as ssh was there then i would not have uh, made that mistake in 1997 so this is uh, how uh, you know it started uh, and uh, ssh has been assigned a port number of 22 today getting a port number from uh, iana is not uh, trivial it takes a little bit of time because uh, there is a process associated with it but if you look at the history behind ssh you will find that it is almost unbelievable this guy who invented ssh he was going to release ssh the next day on a usenet user group uh, so the day before that release he sent a mail to i iana saying that i am going to release this tomorrow i am tentatively currently using the port number 22 it will be useful if you can assign this port number to this protocol the very next day he got a reply saying that port number is assigned to ssh so that is how things were back in the 1990s and the next day he released ssh and since then it, it has continued to use uh, 22 as the default port number so it was released in july and uh, people really felt the need of uh, a tool like ssh which is why by end of the year there were 20000 users across 50 countries who are using this tool and because of the popularity of the ssh uh, the inventor he commercialized it and that company became known as ssh communication security limited it is still there and very much active so this is the early history of ssh uh, and then it evolved from there it was never standardized back then but uh, you know anything that grows too quickly without any standard often results in what it results in uh, interoperability issues which means that ssh clients will try to connect to ssh servers the servers will not recognize the client or the connection will fail in some unknown way because each of the client and server are implemented slightly differently so that is why standardization is important 
and soon people realized that you know uh, ssh is growing too fast without any standardization so there was a need to standardize it. so ssh1 itself has had other issues uh, which we will not get into so the company uh, ssh communication they released the second version of ssh in very next year 1996 so this was meant to solve many of the issues surrounding ssh1 unfortunately 2 was not compatible with ssh1 and the other thing about 2 was because now it was commercialized some of the things were attached to commercial licenses which people did not like because people were already used to ssh1 which was having a more it was having a more open licensing mechanism so that's when uh, you know the standardization groups like ietf which is the internet engineering task force they got into action so they said uh, let's standardize ssh so the standardization of ssh started in 1997 and soon uh, the very uh, same month uh, the internet draft was out for ssh2 and then the early standards started appearing early uh, kind of drafts started appearing and they were implemented by the community so one of the early implementations was open ssh so it was done under the open bsd project so the first version of open ssh came out in uh, 1999 that means already it is uh, close to 25 years that open ssh has been around and open ssh has been has become so popular over the years that today it is a built in program not just in mac or in linux but also in windows so in the early versions of windows open ssh was not available so people used to use programs like putty to do uh, ssh on windows but today that is windows 10 and windows 11 open ssh is included by default so this is the history of uh, so now if you don't want any commercial programs to do your ssh uh, communications you can use open ssh it's a open source software freely downloadable and can be installed on your systems but like i said it comes built in so you don't need, even need to download it unless of course you want to use the latest version of open ssh okay then uh, we lot of changes have happened to open ssh uh, the ssh2 itself was finally standardized in 2006 by the ietf group uh, and then subsequently uh, you know improvements to ssh standard on various uh, friends and details have happened over the years so we will not get into the details uh, maybe later some of these details are relevant or interesting to understand so we'll get into it okay so this is the overview of ssh uh, it may be too early for questions but still i'll open it up to people to ask questions if they have any any questions from anyone at this point are there any alternatives to open ssh yeah there is a, see the company that has commercialized uh, ssh they have their own software so you can use that so that is not based on open ssh that is their own implementation of the ssh uh, protocol then there are other uh, ones as well uh, since you asked that question i'll show that uh, i have a diagram here so you can take a look at this so these are the different implementations of the ssh server so we talked about open ssh but there are so many others as you can see here and some of them are proprietary some of them are uh, having different licenses mit license apache license and so on so and if you this is just a small list if you go to wikipedia you will get a much bigger list similarly on the client side of things there are many implementations of ssh clients open ssh is not the only one okay whenever you typed ssh user id at the rate of server yeah, we use that was open, open ssh implementation okay yeah uh, is it open ssh implementation in windows as well yes yes the same open ssh now it comes as a default installation on windows So uh, to show you that i will open powershell uh, i'm asking because uh, the context is that like when you install git bash right it asks yeah. whether to use windows default or open ssh 
Yeah, you can use either one. So uh, that's why I was because I to... think uh, Git Bash is an older system. In the earlier versions of Windows before Windows 10, OpenSSH was not available by default on Windows. Okay. So there it made sense for Git Bash to bundle OpenSSH along with Git Bash. Yeah. Okay. So now I am on Windows PowerShell. I can do SSH, and I'll get all the options. So this is actually an open SSH implementation. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, now let's get, get into the technical details of uh, open SSH. The first thing is what are the use cases of open SSH? Use cases or we can call them applications. So as I mentioned, the, the most common use case is remote login, and this is what I also showed in the demo. From one system, you can remotely log into another system. So this is uh, where you know SSH really shines. So we have already seen an example of this. The other one is uh, securely copying files or transferring files from one machine to another. So. Uh, so let's say again, we can take the use case of Devopedia. Let's say I have some files on my local system. I want to transfer it to Devopedia server. So I can use SSH to do it. So what, but I will not use this command SSH. Rather, there is another command called SCP. So SCP stands for secure copy. So what secure copy, although it's a separate program, uh, you can, uh, I can also type it here and show it to you. SCP. So you can see what is the usage, what are the options and uh, what are the parameters that have to be passed to this command. So although SCP is a separate command, this is actually running at the application layer. This is running on top of SSH. So SSH is the uh, underlying la layer on top of which SCP runs. Then the other program is secure FTP, which we normally call as SFTP. I've never used it. But let's see if it is there here. Yeah, SFTP is also there. So this is another utility program which also runs on top of SSH. So these two programs, although they are uh, having their own uh, command line interface, they are running on top of SSH, which immediately suggests to us that these are other use cases of uh, SSH. So you can transfer or copy files from one machine to a remote machine using SSH, but you don't use SSH directly, you use SFTP and SCP. Now the other useful uh, use case of SSH is in any kind of uh, cloud-based systems, there is always some sort of automation going on. Now in any automated environment, it becomes impossible for you to ask the user to input passwords. So you cannot prompt the user to input a username and password. At the same time, you can't, you know, initialize username and password in a environment variable or store it in a file and read from the file. They are also security risks. So what is then the alternative to enable automation script to connect securely to a remote system? So the way to do it is through SSH. So you don't need user, you don't need to authenticate using username and password. There are alternative ways of authenticating both client and servers. And you might have heard of things like SSH keys. So using SSH keys, you can authenticate uh, client and server, and these keys are what your automation scripts will use. So this is why SSH has become very essential for cloud-based systems. So to give you a flavor of this, I will open uh, Devopedia itself, the control panel of Devopedia. So this is Devopedia's control panel, and we have here SSH access, right? So SSH access is enabled, and SSH keys are there. Now, if you notice here, I have three different sets of keys. These are all RSA public keys. So RSA is a type of uh, asymmetric algorithm. Some of you may be aware of it. It has two components, private key and public key. So the public key is stored here. Now I have given a comment to one of these keys. It says Ansible access. What does it mean? 
So I'll give a little bit of context uh, what what uh, we are doing with Ansible. Ansible, as you know, is a framework for automation. So what happens in Devopedia is that every time we make a new release, right? So to give you uh, some context there, one more. Let's go to FAQ and help. We make regular updates to the site. So the last update happened on, let's say, April 12th, where there was a patch release. But the major up, uh, minor up, up, upgrade happened on Feb 11. So whenever a new uh, update to the software happens, we don't do it manually. There is an automation script using Ansible, which does the automation, which does the so-called deployment uh, of the new release. So now the Ansible automation script uh, will not wait for username and password to get into the server. So it, it gets into the server automatically because it has been authorized using SSH keys. So this key is basically the authorization public key which authorizes the Ansible script to access the server. Right. So this is another use case where SSH becomes useful. It, so it becomes uh, useful in this particular uh, scenario. The last scenario is again very important. Uh, is port forwarding and SSH tunneling. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but uh, it's easily understood with this diagram. Let's say I have an application, and then there is a server running. Uh, there is this application server is running on a different machine remotely. Okay, so let's assume that uh, this is a news group server, and this is a like remotely xyz.com. Okay. Now I on my uh, laptop, I am running a news group reader. Right, so now this reader is supposed to connect to the server and get the la latest. Uh, threads and replies to earlier threads. Right, so I'm talking about uh, a news group like uh, Google groups or things like that. OK, where people will post questions and in that thread people will post replies. New threads can be created and so on. So there is a news group server running on xyz.com and then I have an application which is a news group reader which will periodically check whether any updates are received. And then it will receive those updates. Now the problem is the system admin on this post. Has disabled the port here. That means news group typically it will run on a certain port. Let's say 119. Now the system admin on this post on this server has disabled that port. Now my client cannot read that news. Why it cannot read? Because firewall has disabled or system admin has disabled that port. Right? So now what is the solution? So the solution is SSH tunneling. So what SSH can do is it can connect this port to a local port. And then open a SSH connection between the client and the server. Then my news reader will be reading the local port. OK, and whenever. Any news updates are received on the server. That will come through the SSH talent into my client. OK, to give you a clear, clearer understanding of this, we can even look at the command which enables us to achieve this. So I have given an example command here. You can see it. So you can see this command port forwarding. So we have a website or a news group channel, domain news.yoyodyne.com where the news port is actually 119. This is the port on the remote server. But firewall or system admin has blocked this port. But I from my local desktop, I should I am I still want to read the news. How do I do it? The way to do it is to open a local port. So it can be any port arbitrarily. We have selected 3002 and then connect that port with the remote 119. So these two ports are now connected through a, an SSH tunnel. Now my local news reader will only monitor the local port 3002. But whenever a news item appears on the server, it will get channel uh, tunneled and it will appear on the local port. So now my, when my reader reads the local port, it will so that request will actually go to the server on port 119 
the response will come back through the tunnel, SSH tunnel. Now the beauty of the tunnel is the tunnel is secure because everything that goes on the tunnel is encrypted. Which means that even if the if this news group is supposed to be an internal news group, that means accessible only to the employees of YoYo Dine, external entities cannot see the content because the content is encrypted within the SSH tunnel. So this is another useful uh, feature of uh, SSH. A special case of port forwarding, which many of you might have used. I have used it yeah, many years ago in my university days. A special case of SSH port forwarding is X forwarding. So what is X forwarding? So you know in Linux or in Unix machines, you have uh, the X windows uh, graphical user interface. So if I uh, want to connect to a remote machine, I will only get a command line interface. With X forwarding, I will not only get a command line interface, but I can also forward the display from the remote machine to my local machine. So that is what X forwarding is all about. So this is not something I have used the last 10, 15 years, but when I was a student doing my masters, I used to run programs on the, one of the super comp computers, which was running a Solaris uh, type of uh, operating system. And then I used to forward that display to my local computer. So X forwarding is something that is very useful. I have used it before. OK, so these are the main applications of SSH. Any questions at this point? Uh, yes, sir, I have a question. So uh, when you were uh, talking about port forwarding or even um, giving uh, or even the use uses of uh, public key. So I just want to talk about one use case which I usually encounter in my enterprise and I usually don't understand like how it works is that uh, there is a remote server for which uh, let's say I want to have access. So I have to give my public RSA key uh, to them so that they can allow me access to that um, uh, remote server via SSH. But uh, but when I read about SSH, it says that uh, when the interaction is to be happened from client between client to server, server usually gives you their key and uh, you generate your session key and pass it on uh, to them and then server decrypts it and then the connection establishes. But uh, in our case, what happens that uh, we just give a public RSA key and then we are allowed access. So how this happens exactly internally? Yeah, so whatever you have said is correct and that is exactly what I have also shown here. You see this example. This is exactly what you have said. What we have done is on the local desktop, we have generated a private public uh, key pair. After generating that, we copied that public key and put it into devopedia.org. Now my Ansible script, which is running for automation purpose, that has access to the private key, right? But now it is when it wants to authenticate with the Devopedia server, because this public key has already been placed on the server, authentication happens. This is exactly the situation which you have talked about, where you place the public key on the server for client authentication. Now, the other use case which you have covered, see there are many different types of processes that happen in SSH. This is just one of the things. So what we have covered so far, or what we are seeing on the screen, this is meant for client authentication. That means server is authenticating the client using RSA public private keys. So, sir, in your case also, you uh, you generated a public key and private key, and you placed public key onto uh, devopedia.org. So, Correct. how does your Ansible uh, script knows that okay, this is the public key uh, to which I have to give access to? You must have told Ansible something about your private key as well. Yeah, yeah. So those things we will get into it a little later if we have the time. But you see, a lot of things happen under the hood. So uh, we will go through the slide, uh, the next topic. Then we will probably okay. by the end of the session you get some clarity on that. But I understood your question. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. So see, the gentleman talked about authentication. Yeah, right. 
So what are the main features of SSH? So at a high level, it is good to understand this. What is SSH actually providing us? So like any kind of uh, security system, the basic concerns are the same. The first thing is authentication. That means somebody is saying this is who I am. How can I verify that he is really who he claims to be? So that is what authentication is all about. That is to say nobody, no third party or a hacker sh should assume the role of a server and fool the client. That is what authentication is about. So now SSH allows for two types of authentication. That means client can authenticate the server and vice versa. Server can authenticate the client. Okay. So what we have just discussed, this is client authentication. That means when I am client, so here when I am trying to connect to the, just now I showed you one example. Right here, I showed you one example where we try to open the NSSH connection and I am asked to enter username, password or whatever. So there I am asked to end, uh, do client authentication. There is also server authentication. What if the server is uh, a fake server? So when I am a client, I want to be assured that I am connecting to the correct server. So that is called server authentication. So client also authenticates that the server is a genuine server. So for authentication, there is a there are a bunch of algorithms which are standardized or recommended by uh, SSH. Then there is key exchange. Now we know that once an SSH connection is set up, all the data has to be encrypted. So why we need encryption? Because we don't want third parties to look at the data and figure out the uh, what kind of uh, data is being uh, exchanged between client and server. That is application data. So data is all encrypted. But before encrypting the data, both the client and the server have to agree what kind of encryption, encryption keys have to be used. So to agree on the keys, there is an algorithm. So that algorithm is the key exchange algorithm. So one of the main features of uh, SSH is to enable client and server to exchange keys. So now there are many algorithms uh, to do this key exchange. One is again RSA algorithm can be used for key exchange, but more commonly people use what is called as the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. So this is not something new. This algorithm was invented in the 1970s. So 50 years later, we are still using this, right? But then when quantum cryptography or quant quantum computing becomes a reality, many of these traditional algorithms will go away. We would need quantum algorithms to keep our system secure. So today we are using algorithms which were invented in the 1970s and they are still good enough. So then encryption we have talked about. Then another thing is data integrity. So it's possible for a hacker to change the contents of a message. Now, how does the receiver know that the messages are genuine? How does the receiver verify that messages have not been tampered by somebody in between? So for that, the traditional way of doing it is you based on the content of the message, you calculate something called the message authentication code. So again, there are many algorithms to do this. So it is what we call commonly called as a hash hash algorithm. Take a message, compute a hash. The hash typically has a fixed uh, length. And then this hash is also included and sent to the uh, other side. Then the other side will also do a similar computation, compute the MAC and then verify that the MAC is uh, matching. So if it is matching, then you know the data is uh, integrity is verified. So MAC in the case of SSH, there is a particular way of calculating the MAC and there are algorithms to do that. So the recommended algorithms are HMAC SHA-2-256 and then SHA-2-512. There are other older algorithms like MD-5 and then uh, SHA-1 family of algorithms. So those things are no longer secure. Similarly, in the case of encryption, there are some older algorithms, for example, triple DES or any kind of algorithm, even, even AES, which has CBC mode. That is, uh, yeah, a particular mode in which the cipher runs. So those kind of algorithms are also not recommended 
they were earlier used as part of SSH, but today they are considered as weak algorithms, so they are no longer recommended. So these are the different things which happen in the case of SSH. So now coming back to the gentleman's question, let's see if we get some clarity. So now when we log into a server, typically when we open SSH connection, some of you would have seen this message. Does any have you encountered this message? Anybody? Yes, so what is this message and what is this trying to achieve? Any guesses? See, we spoke about authentication. So basically, this is about authentication. But does anyone, can anyone give some clarity what, what, uh, who is being authenticated here? Yeah, can you hear me? Server systems. Uh... Yeah, go ahead. I think it is Sanjeev. Is it, is it Sanjeev? Yeah, yeah. So I, I can think... tell from your voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After a long time. So yeah. basically, uh, when I don't have the key or if my key is lost, in the server side or if I format my machine from the client or I change my user ID or whatever. So it is trying to uh, verify whether I have the key or not. So key exchange happens. If I say yes, then the key is exchanged automatically. OK, key exchange happens after I say yes. But yes. my question is, let me be more specific. Who is authenticating who here? See, I this think is the all about authentication. Is, uh, client is authenticating the server because this is uh, prompted from the client console. It, you really want to connect to the server or not? So what yeah. happens basically in the behind the scene, my client key, which was earlier in the trunk of the server, got uh, manipulated or got lost for some reason. Yeah, you are correct. Uh, so another gentleman had some comments. You can also chip in if you have something to add. OK, so if no one else has comments, so what Sanjeev said is correct. So here we are not talking about client authentication. Here client is trying to authenticate the server. So this is the case of server authentication. So let's say I'm connecting to the server for the first time. How can I be sure as a user or as a client that this server is genuine? So what is the mechanism? So the mechanism is I have to manually verify. This is very important. I have to manually verify that this fingerprint is correct. But do we really bother? Most of us, we will not even bother with this. We will simply say yes. Right? If it is a right, then the second thing is. You know, we, we are actually talking about RSA public keys. But we don't see the public key here. Why are we seeing something called RSA key fingerprint? Why are we not seeing the public key here? What is the need for fingerprint? Anyone has a clue here? See, we can authenticate the server, let's say based on the public key. So, so what so is the this private, concept of yeah, fingerprint so here? Basically, the private key is private to me as a client, right? So in the past, I had exchanged my private key or I have registered my private key with the trunk in the server. And that no, this is, uh, uh, there is no past here. We are connecting hmm. for the first time. Ha, for the first time, we have to exchange my private key. I have to share with my server that, hey, look, this is my private key only belonging to me. So no, no, we have not even got to any private key here. Fingerprint, right? So this there is, is no uh, private key here. There is no private key here. So I am connecting is... for the first time. I am connecting to the server. I hmm. want to authenticate the server. And so I am getting this message. Yeah, this is kind of a random, random number which is generated for the first time and it belongs to me only as a client. So RSA uh, algorithm has done it for my behalf. It generated some algorithms uh, have motion control that mouse you move in some way and it creates, it associates some random no, number. So that me. answer is wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyone has a clue? The answer is very simple actually. So you see public key is public. Everyone agrees. Suppose I'm connecting to XYZ.com and XYZ says this is my public key. So now I, as a client, I am connecting to XYZ.com. So what is the first thing I have to do? I have to verify the public key. Correct. So I have to verify the public key. Unfortunately, public keys are like this.
public keys are like this it is a very long string many characters everyone agrees so it is impossible for anybody to manually verify such a long public key so instead when people when the server shares a public key it will also share an rsa key fingerprint and that fingerprint has to be sent to the client via a, a, a what you call as a out of band channel that means either separately it is not part of this transaction at all separately or it is published on the website saying that this is the rsa key fingerprint so now when my ssh client is trying to connect it will uh, compute the fingerprint from the public key and it will show to the user now the user has to manually verify that this fingerprint is matching this is what i expect because it is impossible for the user to manually verify a long public key okay so that is the reason why people came up with this idea instead of verifying a long public key which is difficult for the user let the user at least verify that the fingerprint is matching because if the fingerprint is matching you can be sure that it is coming from the same server which has published that public key sir for okay. verification sir so, for verification so this, so this is nothing but helping us to validate or authenticate the server this is what this is this particular step is all about any questions at this point yes sir uh, just an added comment on what i asked earlier like when a client is verifying a server's identity uh, it is checking basically server's public key or let's say in this case fingerprint so yes. that, then it this means that the fingerprint is derived from the public key i understand so this this means that the client is keeping a list of trusted uh, fingerprints at its end and then verifying okay this is the trusted one which and i should go ahead and uh, allow the connection to it yeah that comes at the second step if you are connecting for the first time there is no such trust established it is only when you connect for the second time you get the trust so let us show this as a demo so one more question so see for the first time when we say yes that means we are blindly accepting it we are not actually telling it right no you don't expect blindly that is why i said you should go to the website and check this is the published fingerprint for that server Oh, and only okay. then you accept it okay Monday. so that means uh, right for the first time how many of us actually also? do that we don't do that this is the responsibility of the user to check the fingerprint okay so for the first time also we need to check this from the website published uh, fingerprint yeah, exactly yeah okay yeah. Uh, a follow up question on that uh, yeah. so like this is a representation of public key right? like the fingerprint uh, so like in the cases where it is published it makes sense like Uh, for a vm that i created how do i know the fingerprint of that and uh, so that is uh, uh, like those who manage ssh servers they will be the right person to answer that question but there is definitely a way to do it okay got it yeah, yeah. So, uh, because i am not so much into ssh admin mm -hmm. but people who manage ssh servers they will know exactly what is the process for this yeah i was but coming if you follow this link process. you may get some uh, let's say you go to devopedia website we hmm. give citations to all the references ah, okay. so here for example this guy says how to do it so if you follow this yeah. how to obtain the fingerprint if you are an administrator this will answer your question yes yes thank you yeah any other questions no that's fine so most of the time when i was using this uh, ssh it was within the same corporate network or institutional network so we hardly tally this and we say yes we want to go ahead <laughs> yeah yeah right but okay. uh, it's is, fine uh, it's uh, fine but this is where if a hacker has got into the network right. you might be in trouble so for the so a practical use case is where is somebody is on a public network and trying to do a ssh on a public server right so i should very well know this is the uh, fingerprint published yeah, then yeah, only i should yeah. go ahead okay. Yeah. okay so now we come to the crux of the protocol so unlike ssh1 which was like a monolith protocol ssh2 has three components so it has been designed in a very modular fashion 
which makes it also extensible. You can easily extend the kind of algorithms you use or, uh, you know, and add extensive, uh, like you can add uh, extend proprietary extensions to the protocol if need be. So the three uh, components of uh, SSH2 are, the first is the transport layer, second is authentication, third is the connection protocol. So the transport layer is basically what, it's a low level protocol that basically helps the client and server to negotiate their support for which SSH version to use and what kind of negotiation is. And at the same time, the key exchanges and the server authentication are also performed at this level. So remember that SSH is running on top of TCP IP. Now TCP IP itself is not secure, right? It doesn't offer any kind of security. To any security you build, it has to be built on top of TCP IP. So this transport layer protocol of SSH is what builds that security layer on top of TCP IP. So it, ex it does the key exchange and authenticates the server. So once this is done, then we go to the next step of the typical uh, handshake where the authentication protocol kicks in. So in the authentication protocol, what we are doing is really client authentication. That means server is trying to authenticate the client. Now the beauty of SSH is there are multiple ways in which the client can be authenticated. You can be doing uh, like username password. That, so that is one typical way of authenticating the client. But obviously username password is not a great way for scripts, automation scripts. So that is where you can use public private key type of authentication, which we have discussed, you know. So I gave an example of Ansible automation where a SSH key pair is used. So that is an example of. Uh, so that is what we call as a. Key based uh, authentication. Then there is another authentication called host based uh, authentication, which is similar to public private key, except that instead of uh, the key being uh, generated for every user, it is being generated for the a certain host name. So let's say a server wants to accept, uh, let's say server xyz.com wants to accept uh, uh, any connection from abc.com. So then instead of generating uh, keys for every user, it will generate just one set of keys for any kind of connection coming from abc.com. So that is host based authentication that is also supported by SSH2. So once the client is authenticated, then the connection can begin. So this is actually the connection protocol. This establishes what is known as a channel. Once the channel is established between the client and the server, then the actual data can be exchanged. So in the case of a SSH terminal, let's say I type commands. I gave an example where I was typing ls command and uh, pwd, right? So all those interactive commands, that is the commands, that is the actual data which goes on the channel. So another beauty of SSH2 is that uh, you can have multiple connections uh, on the same underlying SSH connection. That is to say multiple logical channels, which are all multiplexed on the same underlying SSH connection. So for example, you can be doing port forwarding, you can be having an interactive SSH connection, and both these might be, uh, both these can use the same underlying SSH connection on the same TCP IP connection. So you don't need to uh, duplicate the lower layer protocols for multiple uh, logical connections at the SSH level. So these are the three basic things which you need to know uh, to understand the SSH architecture. So to give you an example of how uh, key-based client authentication happens. So we discussed uh, client authentication earlier, but we did not go into the details. We just said, no, overarchingly, we said it is based on RSA public private keys. But if we get into the details, this is what happens. The SSH client generates a public private key pair. So for that, we have tools like OpenSSH. It has a tool called SSH hyphen keygen. So using that tool, you can generate this key pair. Then you can copy that public key to the server. So we already covered this earlier. 
then at a later point when from the terminal you initiate a login request or from your automation script you initiate a login request to the server then what the server will do it will generate a random number or a random string whatever it may be and it will encrypt that using the corresponding public key because server is already in possession of the public key generated here at the client so now this will encrypt it using the public key and it will send that encrypted message back to the ssh client now the client is in possession of the private key so it will decrypt that message and send the decrypted message back to the server now the server will verify that the message matches that is the encrypted uh, that is the original random message which was generated matches the message which is returned by the client so this verifies to the server that the client is in possession of the private key that means now you, the client is authenticated for the connection to proceed further right so this is how the actual client key based uh, verification works but if you look on the web this is not the only way to do it there are variations of it so you can read about it but this is one of the popular ways in which uh, you know the client based uh, client authentication can happen any questions at this point okay no questions uh, so these are the main things which i wanted to cover and there are plenty of tools uh, which will help you to work with ssh as a developer uh, before we close a little bit of discussion on what are some of the limitations of ssh right ssh works in low latency environments like on the internet it works pretty nicely but what about uh, running ssh on slow connections let's say on a 4g connection or via satellite links so in environments where the latency is high uh, using ssh can be very uh, bad experience for the user of course if you are in an automation environment it doesn't matter but uh, if you are talking about a user going on a interactive shell running commands interactively doing it on a high latency environment can be very painful so this is one of the limitations of ssh and uh, this ssh alone cannot be blamed for this because it is running on top of tcp so some of this has to be blamed for the way tcp reacts to high latency environments so to solve this there is an alternative terminal called mosh mobile shell so this is built on top of ssh so it uses ssh for the initial connection but once the connection is established it switches to udp rather than tcp so for some environments people have been adopting mosh rather than ssh so you can also experiment with this see if it works for your particular use case the other problem is ssh is the ssh keys don't expire now in a big organization you might be having hundreds and thousands of keys i'm not talking about thousands of keys i'm talking about hundreds of thousands of keys this has actually happened in many organizations because they generate keys left and right and you will end up with so many keys that managing these keys becomes a nightmare if you take devopedia for example i generated this keys in 2019 and there is no comment so i don't even know for what purpose i generated this key four years ago now i can delete it but i am hesitant to delete what if some script somewhere is using this key so it might break something so for that reason i have just kept it as it is over time these old keys can accumulate and managing these keys can be a nightmare so this is one of the practical problems of using ssh keys so in any enterprise network they will be very careful on managing in fact you need proper key management software to manage ssh keys now you know that in 2014 there was a sony breach so this breach was due was because of stolen ssh keys that is one one thing 
second thing is uh, you know that uh, this uh, nsa uh, breach uh, that is uh, edwards what is that snowden snowden is uh, imprisoned no or is in house arrest because of this his involvement with uh, nsa breach uh, what they call as uh, information leak papers so that is also believed although it is not proven and uh, not widely published that is also believed to be uh, because of uh, mismanagement of ssh keys so yeah managing ssh keys is uh, one of the things now port forwarding we talked about port forwarding port forwarding occurs at the application layer not at the network layer so that means what it is not completely transparent to the application so for many applications it will work nicely without any changes to the application but for some applications some configuration changes may be needed at the application layer for example uh, if you are doing ftp on top of ssh right ftp data channels don't work very well now you understand why people came up with an application called sftp because ftp on top of ssh doesn't work very well instead what they did they created a new program called sftp which is modifies the at the application layer few things although it is running on top of ssh there are certain modifications at the application layer to make it work with ssh so for that reason you know this is one of the kind of limitation of ssh it is not completely transparent at the for the application if you want complete transparency then you need to implement security at the below the application layer you have to do it at the ip layer or networking layer so that is where things like ipsec and vpn come into play so these are completely transparent to our application but what is the problem with ipsec and vpn they are not simple systems ssh is a very simple system anyone can start using ssh right out of the box that is not the case with vpn and ipsec they don't come out of the box with the default operating systems you have to do extra work to get them installed okay. and i have given some tips here how to make uh, i i means i mean when i wrote this article but actually it is coming from uh, other sources so people have uh, recommended a few things which system admins can do on the server side to make ssh connections more secure at the same time uh, as uh, on the client side also when you are ge generating public private keys you can do a few things to make sure that uh, you know the keys are uh, generated correctly for better uh, security okay and those of you who want to read about all this from the horse's mouth so to speak you have to go to ietf documents these are the main rfcs so this looks at this is not uh, so important you can read the protocol architecture then the three protocols but uh, surprisingly you know these all these documents are very easy to read and the reason for that is simple ssh itself is a very simple protocol so yeah you can take a look at these documents 